This is with Suzanne Bontempo and Charlotte Canner with Our Water, Our World. That's a fantastic program that Sloat has partnered with, and they will tell you more about it. Thanks so much, Suzanne and Charlotte. Take it away. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And of course, thank you to Sloat for having us, as always. Um, yeah, I just wanted to shout out what Jen said as well as we're going to touch on a lot of things today, uh, not so, maybe not as deep as you want, but there's we've done probably almost 20 programs with Slow over the last few years. So if you want to learn more about something that we um, are going to talk about today, there's likely a whole webinar on it. So go back to the Slow website and check out those um, those webinars. All right, but today we're going to talk about how to prepare your garden for winter. And we are going to talk, I'll tell you about the Our Water World program. We'll talk about planting, why fall is the best time, protecting our soil, some garden maintenance, um, and especially preparing for or reducing pests, uh, watering during the, the winter months, fall and winter pruning, fruit tree care, and then some pest prevention. And as always, we'll give you some additional resources we're going to talk for about an hour, and we, as Jen said, we will have questions at the end, but feel free to ask your questions anytime in the Q&A. So the Our Water, Our World program is primarily a clean water program. Uh, we, uh, we have the goal of reducing pesticide pollutants that are toxic to our waterways. We partner with water agencies and retailers, or it's a partnership between water agencies and retailers like Slope, designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality and provide pest problem solving education. So what you'll see in most Slope stores and other stores um, across California uh, are the um, blue tags that you can see on the bottom right of this screen that say eco-friendly, less toxic product. Those are going to highlight the less toxic products on the shelf. And then there's going to be um, likely a rack with handouts about common pest questions. So ants, aphids, rats and mice, moles, voles and gophers um, in many stores. And then we also have uh, posters with QR codes that will bring you to that same information um, easily on your phone or on your computer. Uh, all of our information can be found at ourwaterourworld.org. We'll have the fact sheets on there. We have information about pesticides and we have a list of all the stores that we partner with. So um, why do we care about water and what's the connection with gardens and water and pesticides? Um, so we always, we, everyone lives in a watershed. Uh, we can live in a very large watershed and then even our yards are its own watershed. A watershed is just an area of land that drains into a body of water. So all of us in the San Francisco Bay Area live in the Bay Area or the Bay Watershed all of the water, actually half of the water that falls on California, either in rain or snow, ends up draining into the San Francisco Bay. So it comes from the mountains, you know, across the valley, over farmland and cities, urban areas. And as that water moves, um, it picks up debris and litter and uh, toxins. Um, and then it all drains into the, the bay and the ocean. So um, what we want to do is draw the connection between our actions outside and inside and how that relates to our waterways because everything we do outside um, does have that direct connection when we when water goes down the storm drains at the street level it is going straight to a waterway there's no filtration in between so that means that when we are using pesticides or fertilizers or we're, you know, there's pet waste or motor oil or any kind of debris um, in our area, when it rains or there's irrigation, that will bring that irrigation and that runoff will bring um, all that material into the storm drain and direct it to the waterways. So our goal is to, you know, <laughs> talk about how we can reduce those pollutants, specifically pesticides and fertilizers.
Suzanne is going to talk about planting in the fall. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, planting in the fall. Why fall is the best time. So this is a really great illustration that I found that kind of shows why fall is the best time to add plants to our garden. Keeping in mind uh, that we are now experiencing shorter daylight hours and cooler evening temperatures. So this gives the plants a little bit more time for those root zones to become established without the stresses of the summer heat or an extended period of dry. Because we are expected to get, uh, or, you know, we are expected to get rain throughout the winter months. We've already received some rain. We're getting some rain next week, which is going to be fantastic. And we're about eight or so months until the heat of the next summer is at its peak. So it gives that plant all that time to become a little bit more established. And then we're about 10 months away from the very driest part of the summer. So, you know, thinking about August and September before the rains start, we are really at the driest time furthest away from rains. So this is the best time to add plants to the garden to really give them a head start on health. And the way we plant is really important. So when we're purchasing a plant from a nursery uh, in a garden center, it's not unusual when we take the pot off of that root zone, that root zone is in the same shape and size of that pot as in this illustration, this photo of this four inch perennial. So we want to make, we want to help those roots to grow out and down. So we're going to do that by uh, loosening the root zone up just a little bit. We're not going to completely break it up. We just want to encourage those roots to start to grow out as opposed to around its shape. So we're going to use that plant tag that it came with or our pruning shears closed or even a little stick or anything that we can kind of just start to encourage those roots to grow out and down because we want those roots to look like the illustration on the right. And when we plant, we're only going to uh, dig a hole as deep as that root zone is currently. So in this four inch plant, it's really just about three and a half inches. So that's about how deep we're planting, but it's the soil around that perimeter that we have dug out. We've amended with compost and we're going to backfill in. In this illustration, you see that that root ball is just ever so slightly above the grade of the soil. And this is going to allow for a nice two or three inch layer of mulch that can protect that root zone. And then from there, we're going to start to water that outer edges of that root zone, not at the crown, but the outer edges. The first time we water, we are going to provide significantly more water than we normally would. Newly planted plants, uh, we actually want to apply slow drip where I've, I was taught, there's many ways to do this, but I was trained to get the garden hose, turn the hose bib as low as it can go to where just a little stream of water just before where it's dribbling, a little stream of water, it's going to flow and I'm going to place it at different points of around the perimeter of that plant's outer edge, that drip line. Then you might set your timer on your phone or something similar to for about 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. We really want that slow saturation. This is very important because uh, that soil prior to us planting is most likely dry and that water is going to wick out further. And we want to really saturate that soil in a way that can perfectly hydrate that root zone. After we have hydrated it uh, with this significant deep watering, uh, we'll just go back to regular watering to the plant's needs uh, as it becomes established over the year or two or three that that plant needs to be tended to. And we are going to focus on plants that are appropriate for our climate. We're going to choose California or Mediterranean native plants that adapt to our summer dry climate because we live in a Mediterranean uh, uh, climate here in California that gets its precipitation during the winter months and has a very long dry summer period. We also want to notice the unique microclimates of our garden space because since we live here throughout the 
uh, San Francisco Bay Area, there are so many little microclimates and that's going to be really important when we are choosing plants that are specific for our garden that will grow in their, um, their healthiest. They'll grow to their healthiest capacity when they're picking plants that are appropriate for our climate. So it's super important for us to do our homework. We're always going to plant the right plant in the right place. We are going to match those plants to the condition of our garden to keep them from being stressed because stressed plants are going to be more prone to pest problems. So we want to make sure we're really matching the right plant to the environment that our garden offers. And we want to be mindful that we're matching the right size of the plant. So if we're, we have an established garden and we've got a couple spaces we want to add a plant, it's really important that we know that if it's a space that's really going to be four feet wide and it could be as tall as it needs to be, we're going to um, select a plant that is not going to grow wider than four feet. We really want to make sure that those plants have enough space that we're not going to overcrowd them uh, because then again, if they're overcrowded, they're going to be more prone to some pest problems and we might have to prune them more often than they would need or like to be pruned. So that's going to be really important to understand that size. And we're going to always group plants together as their needs once established. Great time of the year to plant cold season crops. So we can go to Slope Garden Center, you're gonna see a large variety of food that's going to be uh, ready to plant right now. That's going to be appropriate for the cooler uh, season through the next uh, few months of the winter and into early spring. So it's a great time to still get uh, a lot of food going. And some of my favorite cool season crops are going to be the garlic, the onions, the shallots. Uh, this right now is the best time to get those in the ground. I always gauge for Halloween um, so, or like that first week of November. So we are right on time to get those in the ground. But then of course, those brassicas and leafy greens, these are all going to be in abundance uh, and ideal to plant in the ground right now. And then of course our spring bulbs. I mean, that this is just the big treat that we get to, uh, um, you know, this is our, we plant these now and then we get that nice treat uh, of this beautiful color in the spring. And so spring bulbs that are available at the stores right now would be the irises, the lilies, the tulips. However, there's a nice list of deer resistance since most of us live in an area that is often um, visited by deer. We have the allium, the crocus, the daffodils, the grape hyacinths, uh, traditional hyacinths and snowdrops. And I'm sure there's more, but these are just some of my favorites that I always like to uh, add to my garden. And something else we want to think about while we're headed into the winter is protecting our soil. So uh, winter is a great time to kind of passively build your soil. We'll talk about how to do that. So we want to make sure we're protecting our root zones, especially for planting trees and shrubs. Um, we want to top dress with compost and mulch, but we're going to keep um, those materials away from the crown of the plant. I think that's what this woman's about to do in this picture. She's going to move the straw away from the crown of the plant, but keep that root zone uh, covered. Um, and that is going to help with water infiltration, keep water on site in the soil, um, keep that uh, area protected for those roots to expand. So compost, um, you can either you know make your own or buy it at Sloat. Sloat has a wonderful organic compost. Um, it is the organic matter that's already been decomposed by our decomposers, the bacteria, fungus, microbes, worms, and other guys. Um, and this is adding this to the soil now, even if you're not actively planting, is going to help build up your soil uh, without really doing anything uh, over the next few months. So you add it to the soil, it's going to add nutrients um, to your soil, it's going to increase the microbiology. Compost is full of all those bacteria and fungus and microbes. So when you add it to your soil now, 
while your soil is um, moist, it's going to your those that life is just going to keep building and building over the over the winter. And then in the spring, you're going to have really rich, healthy soil. So what you can do is um, apply one to two inch layer of compost around uh, the drip line or the root zone of plants uh, throughout the garden, freshly planted or um, the ones, you know, that the perennials that have been there for years, they can always benefit from the extra layer of compost. And then as those rains come, it'll, you know, work that uh, material down into the soil. And then protecting your soil with mulch has, uh, using mulch has so many benefits. Um, it mainly is a, pr a soil protector. I always will talk about keeping our soil covered. Um, so it's going to um, allow in water to infiltrate easier when you lay mulch on top of the soil. It both protects soil from building a uh, hard uh, crust, which it can do sometimes in the summertime when the sun is like baking down on it. And it kind of holds water there on site to allow it to uh, infiltrate the soil um, easier. So when we're getting heavy rains, um, it doesn't just wash away. It, it will be held in place by that mulch and sink into your soil. Um, and then the mulch also holds the soil in place so that if there's heavy water moving across your property, uh, it will not uh, you know, erode into the street or elsewhere. And then another great bonus of adding mulch on top of your soil is reducing weed germination. So at that very first rain that we are having this week, I know that I'm gonna suddenly have little oxalis popping up, but if I have a nice thick layer of mulch on top, it's gonna suppress that and suppress other weed seeds in the soil. Um, so to reduce that, those weeds germinating. Um, another uh, ver version of mulching is called sheet mulching. This is just kind of like a mulching extra, I don't know, extra mulching. It's like super mulching. Um, so uh, it's called sheet mulching because you're also using layers of cardboard to add an extra layer um, of protection. So uh, great for either smothering a large area of weeds or maybe um, you know, smothering your lawn or part of your lawn uh, if you don't want to do the lawn anymore. Um, you, so you add, you can use, you can leave whatever is underneath in place, lawn or, you know, chopped weeds, um, put compost down or not, you don't have to. And then one to three layers of malt, uh, cardboard on top of that, sorry, overlapping. Want to make sure they're overlapping really well. And then three to four inches of mulch on top of that. What that does is just adds that extra layer of protection. Um, and as the winter rains come, that cardboard and the mulch is going to break down and feed the soil. And you can also plant directly into this, or you can wait till springtime to, to plant some plants as well. Um, but if you do a plant right now into it, you want to cut a hole in the cardboard and make sure that um, your root zone has a little space to um, breathe. And then another way to keep our soil covered and protected and uh, getting healthy over the winter is to use cover crops. Um, again, soil does not like to be bare. So if there is going to be an area of your garden that's gonna be, doesn't have anything actively planted in it, like a veggie garden, I do recommend using cover crops. Um, these crops like fava beans, clovers, um, flax, ryegrass, can be planted and they actually feed the soil um, while they're growing. They add nutrients to the soil and they hold the soil together, which is going to be really helpful during any rainstorms. It's going to hold that soil in place. Um, so, and then also the, another bonus is that uh, the, they sometimes flower and then those flowers will feed beneficials over the winter time when there's less other flowers around. Um, and overall, it's going to increase your soil structure, improve your soil structure and increase the water holding capacity of your soil. And then in the spring, you can chop them down and add them to your compost pile and you're gonna have beautiful, healthy soil to plant your veggies or anything else in. All right, garden maintenance and monitoring for pests. 
This is my favorite topic. I absolutely love garden maintenance. I know it sounds funny, but it's what the garden is all about. We're going to get out there. Uh, we're going to get in our gardens. We're going to do the tasks. We're going to do the, all the cleanup. We're doing the trimming. Um, we're going to be monitoring for pest problems. And that's just what happens when we're out in that garden. But specifically right now, we're going to be picking up any food crops we did not eat. So uh, we want to pick up those apples. We want to cut down those tomato plants. I'm sorry if you're still holding on. Uh, some of us in some areas of the Bay Area, those tomato plants might still be looking good. But really, once the frost comes, they start to get mushy. Those summer squash plants can get cut back. But ultimately, we want to remove any food that's either on the ground or in the plant because it is going to attract pests. Uh, so we want to prevent those pests like those fruit flies, the ants, the rodents, um, and keeping in mind, if you have apples on your property, if we keep those apples, uh, on the ground, yes, they will decompose and offer food, but we can also be harboring some codling moth larvae or some codling moth eggs. So we really want to make sure we're removing any of these food crops because they could be harboring pests that could overwinter. We also want to uh, look at removing any diseased leaves, like maybe from our roses and get them into our green waste bin, that municipal uh, waste bin to take it off site. We do not want to put any diseased uh, branches, twigs, or limbs or leaves into our home compost because our home compost is not going to be hot enough for long enough to kill those pathogens. We also uh, are going to see more slugs and snails. They're definitely more active during the winter months because they love that cool, moist environment. So we're going to inspect where those hiding places are. Oftentimes it's under the lip of a pot or the raised bed or in the, uh, you know, the thickness of that plant because they like to hide from that sun. They're a little bit like vampires. So we're going to hand pick them off. We're going to wear gloves to do that. And we're going to uh, either put them into a bucket of soapy water, feed them to the chickens, throw them out on the lane so people can step on them, whatever. I know it can be gruesome, but we're going to manage those slugs and snails and reduce their hiding places or inspect their hiding places regularly. And this is really fun. Many of us might be, this is a campaign that's building some strength. So we're hearing about it more. I've certainly been seeing it on my social media outlets, but believe it or not, leave the leaves. We have all these beautiful leaves falling right now from our deciduous plants. That is mother nature's mulch. That plant is feeding itself by dropping its leaves. Those leaves are going to drop it's going to be mulch that protects that root zone. Just like Charlotte said, it's, it's going to be falling right where it needs to go at that drip line of that plant to insulate the root zone. And then as it break, those leaves break down, they're actually feeding the microbiology around that root zone. Um, but what else, another thing that happens is that, um, Insects will overwinter in these leaves. Birds are going to come around scratching, looking for food in the form of these insects. Uh, so leaving the leaves is actually doing a tremendous uh, job on helping build the health of the garden ecology. Uh, however, we do want to rake those leaves off of ground cover or off of perennials or succulents because we don't want to smother them. But when we're areas that we can leave the leaves, like in this picture where it's in between those succulents and perennials, please do, because they are going to really provide so much benefit for the butterflies, the bees, the moths, um, and more and more. Something else I really like to uh, do is invite the birds because the birds really help keep the gardens in balance. And another way to invite birds is to allow our plants to complete their life cycle. So uh, yes, I will deadhead my perennials uh, throughout the, the their blooming season. But when I know that their blooming season is coming to an end, I will leave the remaining flowers so that they can go to seed and they can go to berry and complete that life cycle. Because 
all of these, and this is just a small example of some of the plants in my garden, uh, but all of these are providing such wonderful uh, nutrition for our birds uh, in the form of seeds for food or fluff for nests and so forth. So when we can uh, allow plants to complete their life cycle, especially berries from our native plants, we're providing important nutrients for the birds and others in the garden food train food uh, chain uh, to get through the winter uh, with um, and withstand those long cold months. And it's just fun to see the birds visiting the garden. Another really cool thing that I've started doing in my garden, and this is not going to be for everyone uh, because it's not, it's a different aesthetic. So just change your level of tolerance. But now I will prune my perennials. This is a picture of my Shasta daisies on the left with a higher stock at about 18 inches because our native bees, we have uh, so many species of native bees throughout the Bay Area. Um, many of them are going to take advantage of these stocks and lay their eggs using the stems as a nursery. So they're going to lay their eggs stacked between a layer of pollen and possibly a little piece of a leaf or some other material. And then when the, lar the egg hatches, the larva has the pollen to feed off of and then will emerge as an adult bee. So this is pretty cool. And something else I'd just like to share. I love uh, this website, uh, healthyyards.org, but they had this great illustration and this quote that's changing your yard practice might be the easiest way to fight climate change and support your local ecosystem. So it's looking at our gardens, especially during this time of the year, as um, they don't have to be completely clean and pristine. We talk about preparing our gardens for winter, but a lot of that preparation means messy, allowing things to be messy. However, messy in that balanced way that things are going to be healthy, but it's a healthy mess. We're also going to see more mushrooms in our gardens, once, uh, um, which is not a bad thing. Uh, they do pop up when the soil is moist, especially after uh, the rains begin. Uh, mushrooms uh, do help break down nutrients and they feed our plants. Um, they are often signs of a really healthy ecosystem. So that's really important to understand. Uh, they are the fruiting bodies of the underground mycelium that moves through the soil. Uh, we do want to carefully and properly identify um, the mushrooms because it's important to understand exactly uh, if they're, um, you know, just there, you know, given their show, or is it an indicator it, that it is, if, especially when they're in close proximity to a tree, there could be something else going on, you know? So it's always important when we are making these decisions about removing mushrooms uh, to understand one, are they close to a tree? And if so, we're gonna to wanna to take some photos of that mushroom, maybe take a sample and bring it to our local UC cooperative extension for them to properly identify so that we can then address if it's something that is, you know, just going to be a normal part of our environment of that garden, or if it's something that's going on with the health of that tree. Uh, if the mushrooms uh, are not welcome in your garden, then again, we're going to wear gloves and we can just hand pick them and put them in the green municipal waste bin. But they are short lived, and after a couple of days, they usually just disappear. And then of course, since the rains have arrived, uh, we've already started to see some pop up. I've seen the oxalis, Charlotte, I've seen it already. And I'm like, Rrr. so uh, we do wanna keep weeds in check. Uh, definitely that layer of mulch is going to suppress them, but uh, we wanna keep in mind that we are not going to manage the weeds when the soil is wet. 
But once that soil has dried out some and we can walk on it without compacting it, we can hoe them at first sight or, you know, hand pull them or manage them in some way. The big takeaway though, because a lot of times we're not out in the garden during the winter months because it's cold and wet. The big takeaway is to make sure you're trimming these weeds before they go to flower. Uh, and especially before they go to seed, because once they have, we are going to be combating weeds for years. Weeds are very tenacious and their seeds can stay uh, viable in the soil for years to come. So that uh, crabgrass you're managing right now, it's from crabgrass that went to seed years ago. So just keep that in mind. And another tip I can share is that we're going to store and stack and clean and clear our potting benches. Uh, we want to make sure that any saucers that are not being used are upside down. And we also want to kind of clean up our, our pottery, our containers, and have them stacked nicely because this is also going to prevent um, slugs and snails, rodents, and anything else that might want to uh, take up a nice hiding place over the winter months. If there's a little bit of soil and it's not upside down and it's kind of tucked away, oftentimes we find them uh, liking to nest in these areas. And then of course, any water pooling in saucers that aren't upside down will be uh, a new home for mosquitoes that we do not want. And then another tip I can share is that since we are going to move towards some frostier nights, we're going to protect tender plants. So not all plants are frost tolerant. So um, many plants that we might have in our garden could be tropical, such as geraniums or citrus. Um, and some annuals, they'll need protected from frost. So, but many winter edibles, like that list of winter uh, food crops that I mentioned earlier, are actually quite hardy. So those peas, the lettuce, the onions, the cauliflowers, and so forth, these are all going to be very frost tolerant. Um, and they can really withstand temperatures as low as 25 degrees. So if it's going to get below that, we want to keep that in mind for the frost uh, tolerant uh plants in the garden. But um, anything else, uh, we're going to really want to make sure we're protecting from frost. So here's a couple tips. When frost is on the forecast, we want to make sure the plants are hydrated. So Sloat does an excellent job of giving out uh, frost alerts, which I uh, love because that's my, okay, that's my little indicator. Okay, get outside, make sure I put the frost blankets on or I'm spraying with the um, anti-transference. But something that's important is to make sure the plants are hydrated. If we haven't had a rain, um, our irrigation systems are off. We just wanna make sure that soil is not bone dry because if we have a frost, uh, plants with uh, bone dry soil around the root zone is gonna be more prone to frost damage. So we just wanna make sure that is lightly hydrated, not super soaked or anything. We also want to put that nice layer of mulch on that root zone because that's also going to insulate the root zone. It's gonna insulate that soil around that root zone, keeping it warmer and it's gonna protect it. And if we've got smaller containers, plants in smaller containers, if we can move them up close to the house or the shed or the garage, that they'll be more protected from the heat from that structure. Um, we want to also, uh, oh, when we use row cover or I'm sorry, frost blankets, yeah, row cover can be used as frost blankets, but frost blankets cannot be used as row cover. So if you have row cover on hand, you can use that, but it's important to use the material. Um, Frost blankets are designed to really protect the plants, to let moisture wick through. Uh, it's not really ideal to use a sheet or a blanket, but if that's all you've got, go ahead. But it's really best to actually just get the proper material because it's designed to do that job. Um, if wind is a problem, we're going to want to anchor that uh, those frost blankets, sometimes at clothespins or with bricks or stones around the plants to make sure it's not going to blow away. Um, and then these anti-transparents are excellent during the heat of the summer, but they're really excellent during the frosty nights. It's actually just a protective layer 
that is going to keep moisture in and um, prevent evergreens, uh, evergreen trees, shrubs, and fruit trees, such as citrus, from um, it's going to provide them a little bit of frost protection during those frosty times. All right, now we will look at watering and how that changes and what we need to do in the garden in the garden in the winter months. So we talk a lot about irrigation systems. They can be extremely helpful for having healthy plants in a healthy garden. You can have a really simple controller or a really complicated controller that you can you know use on your phone, um, different zones, all that things. But anyway, irrigation systems are wonderful if you can have one. Um, they help you water very early in the morning before you want to get up at probably 4 a.m. Um, and can have more, you know, more consistent watering um, and deep watering, which is really important. We always want to offer our plants deep watering and less frequent so that they have time to dry out between waterings. Um, so let's, we're going to be, so as we approach winter, we might want to change our irrigation system. Whether or not we're having rain, um, the sun is less strong and the temperature, the air temperature is not as high. So soil is not drying out as quickly. So what we can do is uh, check our soil between um, waterings, whether we have an irrigation system or we're just doing it by hand, and see, do we need to water on the same schedule that we have been? Or can we push our watering for another day or so, or maybe even a few days? Um, because yeah, the soil is not drying out as quickly as it was in the heat of the summer. So this doesn't mean you water less in each watering. You're still watering very deeply but you might extend either your, your watering out by hand or your irrigation system to uh, water less frequently. And that ultimately could be, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, or maybe eventually you turn it off if we are getting consistent rain. But we don't wanna turn it off too soon in case, you know, we don't get as much rain as we intended, or maybe we'll get rain next week and then who knows when we'll get the next one. So we still wanna be aware, uh, you know, maybe we'll skip next week because we're gonna get rain. But if we don't see rain in the forecast for a few weeks, we do wanna make sure we're still getting plants water when they need it. So it will just continue, you know, as always, these are not set it and forget it systems. You're still going out into your garden, feeling the soil and adjusting according to the weather. And just like Suzanne mentioned at the beginning, when we're planting new plants, we're going to always water deeply at the drip line. We do that with our established plants as well. It never changes. We're always focusing on the outer edge of those roots um, to help expand the root zone. So with established trees and shrubs, um, the roots that are further out that are thin and uh, those are the roots that actually absorb water. It's not those um, big, uh, you know, healthy roots right at the, at the base of the trunk of the plant. Those are more anchor roots holding the tree in place. It's those far away edge roots that are getting the water. So that's where we want our water to be at the root zone on the outer edge. Um, and then, so this tree, this photo shows kind of where the drip line is, the outer edge of the trees, but a little bit beyond and a little bit inside as well. And then um, we also, of course, we want to make sure we have mulch on the root zone. I'm, I'm going to be honest, I don't know why this picture stops the roots at, at the drip line. So I would keep going with that mulch. We don't want to get it too close to the trunk like displayed on the this picture. We do want to keep the mulch several inches away from the base of the, the plant, the trunk, but we want to extend that mulch out to protect the whole root zone. And then while we're checking our soil for, you know, uh, adjusting our irrigation schedules, we should also be checking our irrigation um, materials, making sure there's no leaks. 
uh, late in the summer, rats and, and rodents can come and chew on these irrigation lines because they're looking for water. So you might have sprung a leak um, and we really don't want, you know, extra water flying into the, the, the garden when there's also rain happening. That's just a waste of water and a waste of money. Um, uh, a broken or missing sprinkler head could waste as much as 25,000 gallons of water, and that's a, almost $150 a month during your irrigation system. So again, check for leaks, make sure the water is going where you want it to go. Um, that also, I kind of should have mentioned also, as your plants grow, you want your irrigation to expand with your plants. So uh, it, your plant might have been nice and small like this, but now it's bigger. So we're going to expand the irrigation to hit the new bigger root zone. And then we want to look around our yard and make sure that we are preventing runoff as much as possible. We do talk more about this in, um, we did a program called Retain the Rain with Sloat, I think last, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago, um, but you can check it out on their website. We go more into how to prevent runoff on your property. Um, but we want to, you know, that help, all the things we've talked about with building healthy soil and planting now and using mulch can help prevent runoff. It keeps water on site and in the soil where you want it, but also things like berms and rain gardens and swales can also help, you know, redirect the water uh, from just flowing off into the street and keep it on your property. Um, the goal with preventing runoff is to reduce overloading the storm drains. Um, you probably all saw some storm drains being clogged or just overloaded last year, and that causes flooding and that causes problems with cars and, pro and structures too. So we want to reduce as much of that as we can. Um, also, you know, running off, as we talked about at the beginning, runoff into the storm drains can bring pollutants into the waterways. So we're going to prevent this by, uh, you know, keeping uh, mulch and soil and debris from clogging the storm drain. Some neighborhoods and cities have adopt a drain program. So you can, you know, if there's a drain in your neighborhood that you know always gets clogged, you can be in charge of that drain to always make sure it's clear before a rainstorm. And note around your yard where there is standing water or uh, things are draining poorly. Uh, we definitely don't want this scene uh, where the, ra the rain is pooling and up it's up around a trunk of a tree. That is definitely going to cause problems for that tree, uh, diseases, and rot. So we really want to note any areas that we see uh, where this is happening and um, when the dry season comes or when the, the area dries out, that's when you can um, deal with it. So you're gonna maybe increase the soil, uh, you know, infiltration and water holding capacity, uh, build berms or anything to get that water away from that area where there was flooding and pooling. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to talk about pruning what type of pruning we do during the winter months. So um, I like this illustration. Uh, I think it's pretty great. It's a nice guideline to pruning. It helps us just as, you know, very um, pulled out focus of kind of general uh, suggestions of when to prune certain things such as flowers, trees, shrubs, and vines would be late winter, early spring. Um, deciduous trees and berries would get pruned uh, during the winter months and then evergreens would be in the early spring or not at all. Something to keep in mind. And then perennials, it could be fall or spring or depending kind of on, you know, what type of plant, what type of perennial they are. But uh, this is the time of year before we get into the heart of the deciduous pruning season to start to um, clean and sharpen our pruning shears and loppers. And um, typically we're not uh, sharpening the pruning saw unless you have a type of pruning saw that can get sharpened, but usually they're um, ever sharp, for instance. Um, and if we are working on a tree or a shrub that has a disease such as fire blight 
um, it is really important and required to clean our pruning tools after each cut, either with a 10% solution of household chlorine bleach or using the 70% isopropyl rubbing alcohol. Usually I just have that rubbing alcohol in a little spray bottle and I spray it down, or I have a small rag with me and I will saturate the rag and wipe my pruning shears. And this is after every single cut because we do not want to spread the disease within that same plant, that same tree. So keep that in mind. And then pruning um, herbaceous perennials. So an herbaceous plant is a non-woody plant where the above part of the plant will die off um, completely or partially through the winter months. So a lot of perennials that we see, such as the sedum, will kind of die back. Um, uh, Agastachys, uh, some mints do this. Um, you know, it's, it's not unusual. It's pretty common with some of the plants we might have in the garden. Um, they may have a root or a tuber or a rhizome or a bulb underground, which will always survive. And then they will um, re-sprout up in the spring. So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna cut those stems back. But if you don't mind creating a little habitat for a native ground dweller or stem dwellers, we can leave the stems taller, uh, 12 to 18 inches, for some of our native bees that will lay eggs, as I showed in an earlier slide. And then woody perennials. Um, this could also include trees and shrubs. Um, they're going to um, kind of grow out and tall. And, and sometimes it is really healthy. These are plants that really want to get pruned. So like in the case of lavenders, uh, we want to typically prune them after their flowering um, season so that we can get another flowering season. But as we move into the winter months, we just kind of want to cut them back um, enough to kind of clean them up. So let's see. Um, we're not going to, like in this illustration, again, we're not cutting them down at the woody base. We're just kind of shaping them lightly. Not a hard prune, but typically a good uh 25, maybe 30% with just kind of shearing them or shaping them. This gives them an opportunity just to uh, clear out any dead uh, growth or broken branches. So that's something to keep in mind. This is kind of the why we do that. And then it's really important to look at the trees on our property. Um, trees are, can have, um, Let's see, sometimes we don't recognize that a limb could be maybe uh, vulnerable uh, or maybe a little weak or damaged. And if there is a significant uh, weather event, a strong windstorm, uh, and if that limb is damaged or is um, not 100% intact, it could fall, it could break if there's too much weight on the canopy, on the outer edges, if the tree wasn't pruned properly. Uh, if the tree was not um, cared for by an ISA arborist, uh, and just maybe you've had your landscaper or some other tree person just kind of trimming it, but they're not really aware of structural integrity of a tree, then we could see some problems. Uh, we really want to make sure uh, that all structures on our property are safe um, and that trees are pruned in a healthy way that when there is a significant rain, a limb is not going to fall and threaten a structure. So um, it's really important to um, have an assessment done by an ISA arborist, not the landscaper or just a person that prunes or cut down trees. They are oftentimes not looking at the tree, the structure of the tree through the same kind of lens of integrity of the health of that plant. So that's just really important. And then we also wanna understand how important it is to prune away any uh, shrubs or trees that might be up against the house because roof rats, that's their kind of access to your roof. Um, my understanding is that we wanna prune uh, the limbs away three feet because anything shorter, the rats can jump uh, that distance with ease. 
And it is not advised to have any vines up against the house. However, if you do, this is a good time of year to kind of thin out those vines, get all that leaf debris cleared away. That's a really nice afternoon project that could take some time. So um, you're going to want to give that a little bit of attention. And winter fruit tree care. I have a couple of tips uh, that I'd like to share about winter fruit, fruit tree care. All right, citruses. So as I mentioned before, citrus, they are evergreen, but they are frost tender. They're not exactly frost hardy. Some of the citrus, especially if they're grown closer to a house or garage structure, they are taking on the heat of that building and they're going to be more uh, tolerant because they have that heat as a protection. Um, but it is very important um, or let me just share a couple things I really like to do with my citrus this time of year, or actually all my fruit trees, but especially citrus. This is a great opportunity to um, add compost to that root zone. Charlotte mentioned it briefly before. Uh, I also, um, you know, we can also use chicken manure if you're open to that, but this is a great time to get that layer of compost or manure around that drip line of the citrus, a good inch or two. And then we're going to, uh, top two to three inches of mulch on top of that to protect that manure, to, to protect that compost. And then through the coming months, that compost is able to kind of work in to that soil, um, feed the microbiology. We're adding more microbiology and we're really creating this slow kind of feeding of the citrus root zone. Um, also that two to three inch layer of mulch is going to protect that root zone and insulate it. So keep that in mind as well. But we're always making sure that that compost and that mulch is away from the crown of the plant, away from the very base of the trunk, really about four to six inches and kind of depending on the size of your plant. We want to thin the, out the uh, fruit. We want to thin um, fruit to reduce the weight. Because again, if there's too many lemons on that outer edge of that little limb and we get a big windstorm, it can break that limb, can break that branch. So it's important to go through and do a little thinning. I know it's so hard to um, remove an unripe uh, tangerine or lemon, but it's important for the health of your tree. And then of course, when the frost comes, we're going to want to protect with a frost blanket. And then uh, deciduous fruit trees, uh, we are seeing the leaves falling off of our deciduous fruit trees. Uh, so it's important right now to remove any remaining fruit for the same reasons. We want to avoid uh, keeping any critters, any coddling moths, any insects, any pests on site. We wanna really make sure that fruit tree is clear and clean. And um, it is going to be important to prune the deciduous fruit trees understand that deciduous fruit trees require pruning to increase the harvest, to increase the yield. And also pruning will also increase the health of the tree. So I know a lot of us are hesitant to prune our fruit trees. We're like, oh, I just, I, I want it to keep growing. I want it to be big. It is very important if you want a healthy tree that is providing you with nice fruit production to prune it right? Uh, the best time of the year to prune is I think January, but really once those leaves drop, you can start pruning. Okay. I just really kind of wait till after the holiday season to get out there and prune. I feel like January is a great time because it's a good like beginning of the, uh, of the new year. Uh, we are not going to prune apricots or cherries. Those are summer pruners after their harvest is when we prune cherries and apricots. And then, um, this is also, you know, pruning the fruit trees is in prep for a dormant uh, application of a pesticide such as a horticultural oil or copper fungicide if needed. This is the best book for pruning. So if you're hesitant about pruning or you're a little nervous or you don't really understand how to approach uh, pruning an apple tree or a plum or um, uh, peach or nectarine or persimmon, this is going to be the book. This is the guide that's been around for years. It has multiple publications. Um, you can pick it up at Sloat. It is excellent. I have it 
I use it every year. I, I bring it out. It fits in my gardening uh, pouch and I can just read it. It's very simple. It's exact. But this illustration also is going to show a couple of tips. All right. So when we get the tree, we always want to start to increase the branches. We want to always have the tree to start to have the structure where it's opened out. And the reason why is because now sun can get in there and really help uh, ripen the fruit and air circulation can also be a little bit easier and more flowing. So keep that in mind. And another illustration I just wanted to show kind of incorrect versus correct. I know that this is going to be tough for just a quick slide, but again, we really want to encourage uh, outer open growth and not tight upright growth. Okay. Tight upright growth is not going to grow a healthy plant and it's not going to have nice fruit production and open uh, wider growth canopy is going to grow a healthier plant and have healthier, more abundant fruit production. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm always a little bit terrified of pruning, so that helps a lot. <laughs> I would definitely need that book with me. <laughs> um, all right, so we are now gonna talk about just a little bit of winter pest prevention. We're almost done here. We've got a couple more slides for you. So does anyone out there have a peach or nectarine tree and had leaves looking like this this spring? Yeah, most most people, every, pretty much everyone did who has a peach or a nectarine. Um, so you may know it's called peach leaf curl when you see that crazy looking curly, reddish, bumpy leaf. Um, it is a fungus and it only affects peaches and nectarines. So I know sometimes other trees like plums and apples will have curly leaves in the spring too. It's not the same disease. It might be, it might be something else. It might be an insect. It might be a disease. It might be just, you know, heat or some other environmental issue. So um, curling leaves does not always mean peach leaf curl, especially definitely if it's not a peach or a nectarine. The only, and then of course, I know it's frustrating when you see the leaves curling uh, and there's really nothing to do once you see those curly leaves on your tree in the spring. Prevention is really the only treatment for peach leaf curl and a spray, a dormant application of copper fungicide during the winter months, so about right now or coming up, is the only treatment um, for peach leaf curl. But what you can do, I will share, even if you didn't spray or you don't get to it this dormant season, uh, you know, focusing on the health of the plant through the spring, summer, and fall is going to really benefit and help your, your tree be really strong to help withstand um, the peach leaf curl that might happen. Um, so always, you know, top dressing the root zone and the drip line with compost using organic fertilizers, um, a foliar application, so spraying the leaves with either seaweed, kelp, or a compost tea can really boost the, the vigor of the plant and um, help build its immunity against uh, diseases. And then of course, proper irrigation, not forgetting to uh, water your trees throughout the hot summer months as well. So all that's not going to cure peach leaf curl, but it's going to make your plant stronger to withstand peach leaf curl if it does arrive. And then aphids, I know a lot of, a lot of aphid problems this year too, that I don't know if it was just the rain or what, but a lot of aphid problems. Um, if you have a plant, a deciduous plant, uh, like roses or apples that are have chronic aphid problems, um, you can also use a dormant horticultural oil um, during the winter season. Um, and that can smother the overwintering aphids and sometimes scale and other insects on the plant to reduce the population in the spring. Probably won't get rid of them, but we might reduce the populations. So when we're talking about dormant sprays, these are some examples. Um, a horticultural oil like the Bonide All Seasons um, spray oil is for killing overwintering insects like those aphids and scale. And then a copper fungicide uh, like the Monterey liquid cop or the Bonide copper fungicide can be used for diseases, including peach leaf curl. 
Um, if you buy, if you have a big tree, you may want to consider buying a concentrated pesticide. I do recommend you buying like the ready to sprays as often as possible when, if that's applicable to you, if it's just, you know, one or two small rose bushes, I would stick to just, you know, a ready to spray. So you don't have to worry about mixing. It just makes it harder when you have to mix pesticides. But if you have a couple of trees, you probably don't want to go through spraying everything. So I do, so you could buy the concentrated pesticide and um, a, a, either a, some sort of sprayer. So the handheld, the tank sprayer or a hose end. Um, just a few things to note when mixing concentrated pesticides, make sure that you only mix what you need. So how do you know what you need? Do a practice run. Fill the tank with, say, a gallon of water, measure it, make sure it's like a gallon or two gallons, know how much is in there, and then spray your tree or shrub uh, with the water, just water, and see how much you use before you really want to coat the branches just up into the point where the water is dripping off, but really you want to get in all of the cracks and crevices and really coat the branches um, and see how much water that takes. It's probably a lot less than you think. So then what you're going to do is you're going to see how much water you used. Say you filled it with a gallon and now you have three quarters of a gallon of water. That means you only need one quarter gallon of water, uh, of pesticide to cover that tree. So now you're just going to mix um, one quarter gallon of pesticide. And then when you're done, when you've used all that pesticide, you want to triple wash. You want to wash out that sprayer three times before you put it away for storage. You're not storing any pesticides in the sprayers. You have to end up, you have to use everything in the sprayer. Um, once, there's a few reasons. One, it's, I believe it's illegal in California to spray or to store uh, pesticides in a sprayer, but also um, you, uh, the material concentrated pesticides degrade quickly once they're mixed with water. So if you're storing it for a few weeks later, it's probably not even going to be effective when you want to spray again. So you want to, and then you want to triple wash that empty sprayer three times before you put it away for storage. And just to clarify, when we're triple washing, we're going to fill a little bit of water into that container, shake it up and spray on the plant a more diluted pesticide. And then we're going to use all of that up. And then we're going to add a little bit more water to that empty tech, shake it up, spray again. We're spraying on the plant. We're not putting it down the drain. We're not spraying the soil or pouring it down into the soil. And then we're going to do it a third time. And after we've done that three times, we've really rinsed any residuals of that pesticide out. And that's how we safely clean out the tanks. Thank you. And then um, we're going to uh, make sure, of course, when we buy a product, we're going to read the label. I recommend reading the label before you even walk out of the store and buy it. So uh, let's look at the, um, the Bonide horticultural oil on the left. It talks about what crop we have. So, you know, focus on uh, what are you going to spray your, your nut trees or your um, stone fruits here? What pest are you targeting? So this, in this case, we have aphid eggs. And then read the notes about timing and dilution rate. So it's going to tell you how much of the product to add to your tank sprayer. And then, of course, there might be notes and restrictions also. There might be limits of how many times per year you can apply. So read the label thoroughly before you buy it and before, again, before you uh, spray. Then let's look at the Monterey liquid cop. So we have our peaches and our nectarines. We are targeting leaf curl. We're going to use four to six te uh, teaspoons. And I assume that's per gallon. I don't know the whole <laughs> um, label here. And then we um, are going to read the notes. It says apply as a dormant or delayed spray to protect buds and shoots during the rainy period. Uh, reapply up until late bud swell and do not apply after full bloom. So that's important to know. And then of course, there's another uh, note here of how the maximum amount of liquid cop uh, that you can apply in a certain area. 
So if you have a lot of trees, you want to look at this note for sure. And then just to clarify what the, sometimes they use language like bud break or bud swell, delayed dormant um, on the, uh, the label. So always good to know what we're talking about. Uh, the dormant bud is nice and tight and closed. Delayed dormant or bud swell turns a little bit greener. And then of course the, um, the pink bud or bud break, you might start seeing the color of the flower bursting open. And we're definitely not spraying when we see bud break and um, we're not gonna spray any flowering plants as well, of course. <laughs> All right, so uh, that was a lot of information. There's more information in the webinars and more information online, but you can always check out our Water Our World website uh, for more information on common pest problems. To go over every pest in California, you can go to the University of California IPM website. Um, they have tons and tons of resources on how to deal with pests in California with less toxic options. Um, for identification of insects, you can go to bugguide.net. And then the National Pesticide Information Center has wonderful, really easy to read resources on common active ingredients in your pesticides. So if you're concerned about health or water quality, I recommend reading up on the active ingredient. And of course, we're always reading the label and applying according to that label. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, thanks again to Sloat and uh, Jen for having us today. Uh, you can always reach out to us with questions or reach or, you know, see our social media. And we'll hang around for a little bit for more questions. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Wow. What an amazing um, presentation of a lot of information, really valuable information. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I'm really obsessed obsessed with the idea of the perennial stems being used as native baby bee nurseries. I know, I, know, I love it. <laughs> it's so cute. All right, the um, first time I saw that was, I think two springs ago where it was a budlia that a neighbor gave me and I never got it planted. So it kind of died. I didn't really care about it. I mean, it was just whatever. And I'd cut it back hard because I was going to get it into the green can, but I never, you know, take the soil off and get in the green can, but I never did and just sat there. And then I noticed that the stems were packed. And then I saw a little native bee go in one day and I was just like, okay, you're just staying here. So it just stays in my garden now this dead budlia I love it. back. I know. And that, so that's why I started uh, expanding to all my other perennials to see, oh, do you have a hollow stem? I'm going to leave you tall. It might, you know, my neighbor thinks it looks weird, but I don't care. No. And it's so cute. And it actually it totally makes sense because those, those little bee houses that you can make with the different yes. size sticks and stuff. I mean, that's yeah. basically what that is. So yeah, it's really cool. Um, there's a lot of good questions. I know you both have seen them and uh, we can try to answer them live here. Um, sure. Okay. Um, can you say more about why soil does not like to be bare? Yes, I can. Um, so, well, I will say there's one caveat here when we're talking about native bees, because we were just talking about them. Oh yeah, thank but you. It is important. So I'm gonna tell you why soil does not like to be bare, but it is good also contradictory to leave a little bit of your yard mm -hmm. uncovered and bare for native ground dwelling bees. Um, if we have everything covered in mulch or everything planted, uh, the ground dwelling bees don't have access to the soil where they like to nest. So um, yes, if you can leave, you know, one little back corner of your yard a little bit bare and uncovered, that would be really helpful for that population. Generally, soil does not like to be bare um, because uh, when it is exposed, it's exposed to the elements. It can, the sun beats down on it, that it gets hot. Um, and that can cause it to a few things. It can cause it to dry out or create like a crust on the top. Um, and both of those are very bad when there's a, like a hard crust on top, water won't be able to infiltrate. Um, it literally turns soil hydrophobic. It repels water um, and you won't be able to, you could water as much as possible. It's just not gonna go in, it's gonna bead off. 
Um, so uh, covering it in the summer is very important to keep the soil moist and um, not turn into like dry or dust so that it doesn't blow away. It also, we want it to stay moist because microbiology in the soil needs moisture to live and to function um, as well as your plants do as well. Um, and then in the winter, we don't want to leave soil bare for similar reasons. When it's exposed, uh, rain can beat down on it and break up the, the soil particles, and it can pull the soil off site and, you know, turn, um, you know, just it can erode your soil. So we want to really keep it covered so it can stay nice and healthy, clumped together and protected from the elements. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay, there's a lot of good questions. We're not gonna get to everyone, but I'm gonna try, try to pick out, uh, what about feeding now and over winter for perennials? Yeah, uh, thanks for a asking that question because I didn't address it. Um, this isn't the best time to add fertilizer, but if you do, then it's going to be a fertilizer that's going to have a very low nitrogen number. Because remember, nitrogen uh, encourages a lot of above ground growth. And we don't want to stimulate a lot of above ground growth if we're going to get a frost because those tender leaves could get damaged. Uh, I typically focus on my fertilizing in the late winter, early spring. Um, and then again, in the summer or late summer, early fall, uh, that's why right now I really like to take advantage of that compost layer or that chicken manure layer that's on top of the root zone underneath my layer of mulch. That's the best thing to do as we're moving into the middle of November. Yeah, I, sometimes I do like a high phosphorus uh, mm -hmm. fertilizer, but um, like in January, February. Mm -hmm. But yeah, feeding earlier in the year, you know, like that late winter, early spring. And then again, in the summer, um, depending on the plant or again, like October is a really good time. The beginning, late September, beginning of October, but now it's a little too late. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh... Okay, so there's a lot of questions on pruning and um, edibles and stuff. And what I would say is I would encourage you to go look at the recordings because there's definitely a deeper mm -hmm. dive into like correcting bad pruning on fruit trees. We've done that. So look that up um, and uh, deeper dive on edibles too. But so maybe we'll close out with um, native seed. Oh. What do you, how do you recommend yes. um, putting that down now? Do you want to do anything to the soil first? Yeah, great question. Um, this is the excellent time to get native seed out right before rain. Uh, it's not a good idea to put it out on a sunny day because the birds will say, thank you so much for this delicious food you just gave me. But if it's like Tuesday, I guess we're going to get a big rainstorm. So right before that rain starts to get that seed out and really let that rain kind of um, pelt it into the soil kind of, of course we don't want it to run off, but you know, maybe after the big torrential downpour when we still have rains afterwards might be a better timing. Um, but applying the seed during the rainy season is the best time. You need to mix it in with a topping, so like a soil or anything, or just sprinkle it right on top. I, yeah, I just sprinkle it right on top because I used to do that and I didn't have the same success. But now that I've learned the timing is really about with the rains, it's the seeds will go where it needs to go with that rain kind of pushing it into the soil a little bit. 